it's not about creating a style. It's about uncovering what's already there, buried deep inside. When you take off the training wheels and stop depending on copying others, your unique style will appear. Everyone already has a style of their own. They just don't know what it is yet. It's the Inspiration Place podcast with artist Miriam Shulman. Welcome to the Inspiration Place podcast, an art world inside a podcast for artists by an artist, where each week we go behind the scenes to uncover the perspiration and inspiration behind the art. And now, your host, Miriam Shulman. Well, hey there, Artpreneur. It's Miriam Shulman here. I am so excited to chat with you today. This is episode number 266. And oh my goodness, this is a good one. So my publisher said that I could share an audiobook chapter with my audience. And one of my favorite chapters is Embrace Your Inner Weirdo. Now, I already have a few podcast episodes called Embrace Your Inner Weirdo, and we'll link those in the show notes. That's not what this episode is exactly the same content, so I didn't want to confuse you, but this is actually the chapter that you would find inside the audiobook. For those of you who've already gotten it, thank you very much. For those of you who haven't, here's what's in store for you. So one thing that I did which I don't know that anyone else has done this, I decided to include podcast clips of my podcast guests whenever I quoted them throughout the book. So I pulled the quotes directly from different podcast episodes. And I think we're going to be linking to that as well. So we'll make sure we have a list of all those linked for you for the show notes. Okay, so besides me narrating it, you're going to hear from Jennifer Kem. You're going to hear from India Jackson. You're going to hear from my first business coach, Jason Van Orden, and also Ron Reich. You're going to hear from Sean Roney, who's the resident mindset coach inside the Inspiration Place. You're going to hear from my good friend, Michael Shine. You're going to hear from, is there anyone else? Yeah, my friend Kelly Hollingsworth. So you're going to hear from them, not just me reading what they say and not just a robot creepily saying what they said. You're going to hear them speaking in their own voices. So that's what makes this audiobook super fun. Now, if you want the bonus package that comes along when you purchase the audiobook, and this is for you, even if you've already bought either the Kindle, the physical book, or the audiobook, you can still get the bonus package. So to get the bonus package, all you have to do is head on over to artpreneurbook.com, artpreneurbook.com. Obviously, we will link that for you in the show notes. There is so much in the bonus package. It makes it worth way more than the cost of the book, no matter what format you get it. And if you are an audiobook subscriber, you can just use your credit for the full audiobook. If you've never done Audible before. I'm an Audible credit, by the way. If you've never done Audible before, your first month is free, so you can get the book for free. The Kindle's only $9.99. And no matter what format you buy it in, you do get the bonus package, which includes an art journal video workshop. It includes artist insights, which are panels from different success stories to help inspire you with how they found their success using these principles. We have another panel that includes Jennifer Kem and India Jackson, who you're going to hear from today. And we even have one on spirituality and creativity, which I absolutely loved. I don't really get into spirituality that much in this book, but who knows, maybe, maybe in my next one. So to get that bonus package, you just need your order number. If you bought through Amazon or online or whatever, you can look that up. Hey, if you don't have your receipt and you went to a traditional bookstore, which by the way, I applaud you, no worries. We've got you. All you have to do is take a picture of yourself with your book and mail it to me, Miriam at the inspirationplace.net, and we'll make sure you get that bonus package. So we're not discriminating depending on how you order. So 
On that order page, you just put your name, your email, and the order number. And if you want the bonus package and you can't find the receipt, email a picture of you with the book. And yes, my friends who check things out of the library, you can go to your library and request it there and take a picture of you with the book. That counts. Okay, my friend. Without further ado, let's dive in to chapter six of Artpreneur, Embrace Your Inner Weirdo. Chapter six, Embrace Your Inner Weirdo. When my fourth grade teacher dubbed me class artist, I transformed my internal self-concept from weird new girl to artist. All those traits that I thought had made me weird or different were actually my superpowers that enabled me to see differently and hence make art. To be an artist is to identify connections in the world and help people see the world in a different way. That's what art does. When you create art and your marketing, you'll also learn to embrace your inner weirdo so that your art stands out. In the last chapter, you heard about the five foundations of the Passion to Profit framework for building your business, including production. One of the keys to creating a solid production plan is creating marketable art. But what makes art marketable? How to Create Your Signature Brand Your audience is looking for something different from what's already out there. They're tired of the same old, same old. That's why a marketable production plan includes developing a signature style and brand. Since you can't separate the art from the artist, your signature brand will include the kind of art you produce, your messaging, and the way you show up in the world. Jennifer Kem, a brand building and leadership expert in the Bay Area who also works with celebrity businesses such as Oprah Winfrey Network, defines brand this way. Your brand is the soul of how you're communicating, how you help people and what the experience they can expect to have in the world. And so in my mind, no pun intended, I really believe brand, the brand is your art and the rest is science. Marketing is a science, <laughs> sales is a science, but your brand is the soul of how you're presenting yourself in the world in all forms. Without a signature brand and style, you'll struggle to market effectively because your body of work won't be cohesive. Regardless of the marketplace in which you're selling, online or in person, or the art form, all the artist's work should feel like it's made by the same artist. Stylistic choices matter in all art forms. If you're a choreographer, is your style modern, classical, or some hybrid? Musicians might be drawn to atonal patterns, as in the work of Schoenberg, or to more romantic motifs like those pioneered in the works of Clara Schumann. As you experiment, your signature style may evolve over time, but should consistently reflect who you are at any given moment. The art you create will be an extension of your brand's message and vice versa. Your brand and signature style go hand in hand. Many new business owners believe their brand is limited to the colors, fonts, and logo that appear on their website. However, India Jackson, founder of the brand and visibility agency Flaunt Your Fire, offered a broader definition sharing, when we think of branding, we think of it as your public image, your reputation. The colors, the logo, the type of art that you create, how you dress, what your photographs look like, what your captions are about, what subjects you cover when you are connecting with your people. These are all shaping what would be said about you, but they're not necessarily the brand on their own. In other words, anything you do and say will be perceived as part of your brand, especially as an artist, since we are considered 
personal brands. That's why we'll be talking about your overall message as part of your signature style. Developing a signature style and brand requires vulnerability because your values, quirks, and imperfections inform your distinctive voice. As you make your voice more apparent, these differences will likely attract both fans and haters. Avoid the temptation to play down your uniqueness to appease the haters. Playing a more audacious game always attracts haters because they resent you showing up in the world in a way that they're still afraid to do. Some people will find fault with you no matter what you do. But if they hate you for your uniqueness, at least you'll know you're doing something right. And please resist the urge to keep your style and art under wraps as it evolves just to avoid negative feedback. Business coach Jason Van Orden agrees. Your voice is that thing that, you know, it's the thing that only you can bring to to the world, but it takes some time to like find and unlayer it and kind of identify it. And then I'd say it takes even longer to learn how to really own it and embody it yourself to a level that now the world sees it and you unabashedly share it so that people just have no choice but to uh, take notice So go out and start expressing your voice as you're discovering and developing your signature style. All nine of these following steps ask you to be authentic and vulnerable and to lean into everything that makes you unique. Step one, go beyond your influences. Once you've mastered the fundamentals of your art, you'll be more comfortable breaking the rules to add your own spin to what you've learned. Don't make the mistake that many novices make of looking around to see what's selling and try to imitate that. Too many artists have no idea how to create something original to stand out in a crowded marketplace. I've also noticed a race to emulate what's popular in the way new business owners operate. For example, they've learned how to imitate the mannerisms of the gurus they admire, but they lack originality in developing their own marketing voice. In the bro marketing world, goatee Tony Robbins minions with their matching black turtlenecks jockey for attention, while in the spiritual guru space, long-haired Gabby Bernstein wannabes sip coffee with nut milk. There's nothing wrong with modeling successful people at first. In fact, learning from the masters is a crucial step in your journey to becoming great yourself. Even the most acclaimed painters and sculptors of all time also learned through copying. Degas copied Rembrandt. Michelangelo studied Greek sculpture to better pose the body in marble. However, Degas eventually embraced a style that looked nothing like Rembrandt And although Michelangelo's sculpting skills rivaled the Greeks, you'd never confuse one of his sculptures with one done by Rodin or Camille Claudel. Many artists develop a marketable style by taking existing ideas and putting their own spin on them. For example, Picasso was infamous for taking somebody else's idea and then executing it 10 times better. But Picasso never copied popular trends. He adapted unpopular avant-garde ideas and then made them popular by adding that little twist so that suddenly people understood the new art form. Overall, the key to creating a signature style and brand is to sprinkle a bit of spice from each of your influences and combine them in a new way so you're completely original. When my students ask, how do I create my own style? I tell them, it's not about creating a style. It's about uncovering what's already there, buried deep inside. When you take off the training wheels and stop depending on copying others, your unique style will appear. Everyone already has a style of their own. They just don't know what it is yet. 
What makes uncovering one's style so difficult is that most of us, women especially, have put ourselves on the back burner for our entire lives, which means we've never spent any time uncovering any parts of ourselves, let alone our own artistic styles. Creating and marketing your art should be a joyful process. When you start exploring and discovering what you love about that process, you'll be making artistic choices that enhance that joy. For example, if you're a visual artist, you may be drawn to certain colors because of how they make you feel. Or you'll start to have fun with wonky lines because you get impatient with precise details. Or you'll realize you want to put polka dots on everything because you like them. Japanese artist Yayoi Kasama began creating intricate polka dot art almost obsessively. Kasama had been very open about her lifelong struggle with mental illness and credits her art with giving her an outlet for her obsessiveness. She first emerged on the avant-garde scene in 1968, and her art has gone in and out of fashion. Now well into her 90s, her polka dot sculptural installations attract millions in the most prestigious venues around the world. Finding your own style is like the process we all went through as adolescents, trying to navigate fashion trends. Now, I know some of you might be shaking your heads because you still don't have your own fashion style. I get that. But if your style is based on copying others, you'll never feel as though you've done it right. For example, no matter what I wore to my kids' school events, I couldn't capture the expensive yet casual, look those other moms nailed so effortlessly. Now that I'm in my 50s, it's a different story because the truth is I really don't care anymore. Not to mention that PTA events are ancient history. I'm done copying other people's styles and calling them my own. If I feel comfortable wearing it, then it's the perfect thing to wear. I don't need to wear a uniform or look like the people around me and I'm happy to look different. I want to be weird in my dress, art, and business. When I create, I wanna go to a place that's unusual, embrace my inner weirdo, and trust my intuition. Eccentricities make art better, more memorable, and ultimately more marketable. Step two, amplify your quirks. You can develop your authentic voice by embracing what makes you weird. Although the word weird might make you feel uncomfortable or may sound insulting, consider the origin of the word. The history of the word weird can be traced to Scotland and was popularized in Shakespeare's Macbeth. The Weird Sisters prophesies Macbeth's destiny. And in Elizabethan England, the word weird meant fate or destiny. The association with the supernatural morphed the word's overall meaning. As people began to reject the mystical and supernatural, weird began to take on negative connotations. But where your art is concerned, remember the word's origin. Society trains us to vilify anything that's eccentric or different. When we recognize traits of our own artistic voice that differ from the mainstream, we need to deliberately raise our authentic voices, not quiet them. To make it as an artpreneur, amplify the very things you might consider weird about you and your art. At its core, Weirdness is the magic that separates the merely mundane from the truly special, and embracing that magic is the secret to fulfilling your destiny as an artist. Make sure your marketing reflects your quirks as well. One of my former business coaches, Ron Reich, likes to call himself a quirky marketing genius. He encourages entrepreneurs to lean into their quirks and talk about them because these are the things that make you more of a multi-dimensional person. 
His advice is to ask yourself. What are like one or two things about you that have nothing to do with your expertise or you being an artist, but just are interesting that people are going to relate to? When Reich shows up on social media, writes emails, or is interviewed on podcasts, he talks about his dog Trevor, his obsession with Nutella, and fitness. He recognizes what he's doing. So yeah, we got a little bit of a juxtaposition there, which which is, you know, all those things are good. That's more interesting. It's a fitness dude who's in a Nutella. When you're lost for words in your marketing, think about obsessions of your own that have nothing to do with your art and talk about them. Your audience wants to connect with the real you behind the creations. They may not share the same obsessions, but those idiosyncrasies make you a more relatable person. Step three, stop people-pleasing. People-pleasing, showing up in a way that you think will make people like you better. If you're reluctant to be weird or even different, it may be because you're inclined to people-please. People-pleasers create art that resembles what's most popular, not because they don't know how to create different or original art, but because they're afraid of what other people might think. When I interviewed life coach Sean Roney, we discussed how people-pleasing sabotages art and business success. She shared that it's a waste of energy to try anticipating what anyone else might think. And more importantly, she asked, are you actually being authentically you? The person, like, let's say you show up a certain way, the way you think someone wants you to, and they like it. It doesn't feel great anyways if it's not what you would do normally, who you would normally be. The person that they're liking isn't really you. When you hide your eccentricities, you're not showing up authentically. And most often, these are the very things that make you more memorable. When you market your art, make your point of view stand out from the crowd. Stop worrying about being weird and pleasing everyone. Instead, make and promote that very special art that only you can. Step four, share your values. Many artists fear that if they reveal their beliefs, they'll alienate people. Believe it or not, this is what you want to do. I asked Michael Schein, author of the Hype Handbook and founder of Microfame Media, why he encourages his clients to pick fights. He pointed out that... People are very tribal. However, that doesn't mean you have to use that to be a demagogue or a racist or a hateful person. You can pick a fight with an idea. You can pick a fight with another scene. You know, I mean, the abstract expressionist picked a fight with who came before them. And then the pop artist picked a fight with the abstract expressionist. Everyone put themselves across as, you know, that's the old scene. Let's be something new. And and that was a successful approach for a lot of art scenes. You can find examples of this in all art forms. For example, the grunge music of the 90s, popularized by rockers like Courtney Love and bands like Nirvana, were rejections of the computer-generated sound of the 80s. Then, the women of the post-grunge musical era, such as Alanis Morissette, wrote and performed songs that defined what it meant to be a woman that contrasted with Nirvana's aggressively male sexual cock rock in the decade that preceded her. When you present your point of view in a way that contrasts with the artists who came before you, you create a brand that stands out and will be marketable. One can't talk about what it means to own your voice without highlighting Beyonce, the queen of R&B, and one of the best-selling recording artists of all time. To date, she's been awarded 28 Grammys and sold 118 million records worldwide. Yet, her music isn't for everyone, as she stands firmly in her activism. Unafraid of alienating Republicans, Beyonce has performed in fundraising efforts for both Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. And at a 2016 Clinton fundraiser, her backup dancers performed in pantsuits and I'm With Her t-shirts. 
Moreover, Beyonce's flawless lyrics sample Nigerian activist and author Samamde Ngozi Adichie's TEDx talk, We Should All Be Feminists. Your values become part of your message, and your brand embodies your signature style and will be perceived as part of your artist persona. Throughout history, you'll find countless examples of artists who highlighted their values. Late 19th century France offers a good example. At a time when many people felt defensive, insecure, xenophobic, and nationalistic, a heightened climate of anti-Semitism took hold, and the French government wrongly accused a Jewish captain, Alfred Dreyfus, of treason. Novelist, playwright, and journalist Emile Zola published an editorial piece in support of Dreyfus, putting pressure on the government to reopen the case. Known as the Dreyfus Affair, this political scandal divided France into pro-Republican, anti-clerical Dreyfusards and pro-army, mostly Catholic, anti-Dreyfusards. Records show that Claude Monet, Camille Pizarro, and Marcel Proust were pro-Dreyfus, while Cezanne and Degas were both anti-Dreyfus. Degas was most vocal about his anti-Semitic opinions. Auguste Renoir hoped to appear neutral. As the country was divided, this had far-reaching ripple effects in the French art world. Rodin reneged on a commission sponsored by pro-Dreyfus arts. Moreover, Renoir refused to exhibit with a gang of Jews and socialists. A whole nation looked to artists and asked them, which side are you on? Trying to appear neutral on lightning rod political subjects is a particular form of people-pleasing. You cannot choose both sides of an issue, especially as an artist looking to define your voice. Your opinions, values, and quirks all become part of that. Fast forward to today when the United States has been experiencing its own period of great insecurity, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, and nationalism. The murder of George Floyd in May 2020 triggered a social justice movement and a level of civil unrest and positive activism across the globe. On the weekend following the murder of Floyd, I came across an Instagram video by business coach and author Rachel Rogers with the cynical caption, The Good White Liberal Response. Rogers appears without makeup or pretense in an unscripted, raw, and emotional rant. She clearly intended it for her audience, but the publicly shared video went viral within hours. When I finished watching it, I looked up at my husband and I sighed. I I screwed up. My husband lifted his eyes from his crossword puzzle. What are you talking about? I told him about Roger's response to a well-known business coach who had shut down her Facebook group's chat feature because she didn't want to facilitate tough conversations in the wake of George Floyd's death. Yeah, that's terrible, he agreed, but I still don't understand what this has to do with you. It's about white privilege, I said weakly. I'm part of that problem. As an art teacher... I hold space for students of all beliefs. Up to that point, I had thought sharing my beliefs on my public social media platforms would repel those who voted differently than I. It does. However, since I hadn't been forthright about sharing my own values publicly, no one knew what they were. As a result, I hadn't attracted an audience in alignment with my values either. In addition, I also hadn't made enough of an effort to invite people to my podcast who reflected the art world's broad diversity. Although I consistently highlighted female artists and thought leaders, I hadn't done enough to be inclusive of all women. Roger's video 
was more than a critique of any leader when she said, if it doesn't cost you anything, it's not enough. I knew I could do better. Now my podcast regularly highlights people of all races, religions, and sexual orientations. And as a result, the audience that I serve reflects a strong commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. As artists, we respond to our world by creating metaphors that show people how to feel. Politics, the environment, social justice, sex. These are all part of our world. To be an artist is to share your feelings about your ideals through your art, words, and actions. Some of us convey messages directly through art. Others take a stand through public words and actions, and of course, some do both. But no matter what kind of art you create, your words and actions will become part of your message. Art is about taking risks. And artpreneurs take risks in all areas of life. They live their art and embody it on all levels to remain true to their beliefs and core values without looking over their shoulders to see what others think. And they don't make statements just to be performative. When you share your authentic self, not everyone will like you. But if they don't like you, at least let it be for the right reasons. I generally don't consider my art a form of activism. Yet, on October 8th, 2020, I had an idea. I posted my watercolor painting of a fly on social media with the following caption. Behold the humble housefly. They are naturally attracted to anything rotten or dying. This one small fly unleashed a maelstrom under the post. Hundreds of people announced their outrage, including this comment. Done with you. Love art, not politics with my art. On the other hand, others responded in favor of the content. Never mind the unfollowers. I'll follow you harder. On any other day, the fly and my caption would have gone unnoticed. But this post generated hundreds of shares, comments, and reactions of all sorts because I posted this watercolor one day after the vice presidential debate. For a few minutes of the debate, a fly had stolen the show by landing on the snow-white hair of Mike Pence. I love how the simplicity of the post triggered an outsized reaction. Although I lost many followers that day with just one fly, I gained something larger. I showcased a piece of art that made people think. I took a risk, and in doing so, shared my values. While conducting research for this book, I revisited the post to pull some comments representative of the reaction without including anyone's personal politics, which is beside the point. A comment I hadn't noticed before made me smile. This is a beautiful piece. Of course artists interpret and create art based upon current events. That's what's meant to happen. The commenter? Rachel Rogers. Step five. Embrace imperfection. Liz Lewis knows a thing or two about what separates the merely talented from those who rise to superstardom. As a celebrity vocal coach, she has worked with rock stars such as Rihanna, Miguel, Demi Lovato, Courtney Love, Britney Spears, and many others. She believes it's personality rather than perfection that makes all the difference. In an interview with Hits Magazine, she shares... You don't want them all to sound beautiful. Some people shouldn't. Some people have a rasp or some other particular quality, and you don't want to lose that. I like to think I specialize in helping each person bring out who they are. 
Lewis also notes that superstar Britney Spears set herself apart by injecting Valley Girl talk into her singing. When Spears recorded her hits in the late 90s, this vocal style was revolutionary. Since then, there have been so many copycats that we take her innovative approach for granted. Here's what you need to know. Britney Spears differentiated herself from other singers by leaning into the stylistic quirks that others viewed as mistakes. Had Britney's vocal coach tried to normalize these differences, you might be asking yourself, Britney who? Leaning into stylistic variations set her apart, which helped her reach the highest level of attention and stardom. Her differences made her music resonant, compelling, and interesting. Beyond her voice, her personality, look, and overall point of view made her unique, allowing her team to crank the idiosyncrasies all the way up to an 11. Here's the main thing I want you to remember. You do not have to give up your weirdness to create art. In fact, the exact opposite is true. You must give in to your weirdness to create art. Go to that place that's different from everyone else and create art that's different without caring about what other people think. Don't get mad or upset or be resentful. Just embrace that weirdness on every level. The best art in the world is produced by us weirdos. Don't imagine you need to make everything perfect. After all, perfection is an arbitrary construct. Just incorporate your differences, quirks, values, and weirdness into your art. Crank up the volume on all that makes you different. Step six, honor what comes easy for you. My husband decided to plant a garden this year. He went to a nursery and picked out pricey baby starter tomato, eggplant, and pepper plants. While he was at the register, he tossed in a few cheap packets of seeds for sunflowers, cucumbers, and green beans. When he got home, I helped him empty the back of our SUV of all the trays. In the hot sun, we dug holes for each of the baby plants. This process took all afternoon. Then he remembered the seed packets and sprinkled the seeds around the perimeters of the empty beds. The baby starter plants looked so promising with their leaves blowing in the wind. Unfortunately, within a few weeks, the eggplants we worked so hard to plant shriveled on the vine. We lost most of the tomato crop to hungry insects. Finally, the pepper plants produced a few anemic-looking vegetables, but were nothing to write home about. By contrast, within a few weeks, sprouts from the scattered seeds pushed through the soil, and within a month, those plants caught up in size to the pricier starter plants. Shortly after that, each of the bean plants dangled jewels of beautiful long string beans, and the cucumber plants were adorned with white flowers. During the hot months of July and August, we had enough cucumbers to feed us and all of our neighbors. Moreover, the sunflowers that started off as humble seeds towered over the garden with their huge Van Gogh-sized faces of yellow gold. Next year, we'll be sticking with the ease of the seed packets. Sometimes the things that come easy work out the best. Society teaches that you must shed blood, sweat, and tears for your work to have value. For artists as well, when something comes easily to us, we may not value it as much. This, of course, leads us to underprice our art. For example, when wedding photographers want to switch from back-breaking gigs every week to family portrait sessions that pay twice as much for less work, they might feel guilty. But just because your art form is easy or pleasurable for you doesn't mean it's not valuable. Honor what comes easy to you and remember that just because it's easy for you doesn't mean it's easy for most people. 
What took you an hour may take someone else all day, or they may not be able to do it at all. Step seven, open yourself up to feedback. Don't wait until you found your voice before you start marketing yourself. I see too many artists who want to disappear in their studios and not come out until they've perfected a style. They believe that marketing an immature style will hurt their careers, when in fact, the exact opposite is true. You won't discover your signature voice in the studio. Go out and perform it. Part of identifying your voice is opening yourself up to feedback. And marketing your art is the best way to do that. You'll need time to identify your uniqueness as your style evolves. You might not even notice what makes you unique. But feedback from your audience will help you recognize your special sauce. That's why I continue to exhibit in person. Art shows are a lot of work. But the feedback lets me know what my audience is interested in. I also continued to teach in person, even after I got the online art classes going. I understood that the real-time feedback from students made me a better instructor. You'll get some feedback online, but mostly you're either going to get positive feedback or silence. You can't learn anything from silence. A marketable style doesn't mean everyone loves your art. When you do arrive at your signature style, it will be marketable because though some will hate it, others will love it. Step eight, stop procrastinating. Another reason artists don't market their style while it's evolving is that they're stuck in procrastinating learning mode. Recognize that procrastinating learning is a form of perfectionism that will sabotage your results. When I interviewed Ronnie Walter, author of License to Draw, about licensing art, she shared, It's easy to hide in the research phase. Like, well, I need to know everything about licensing. I need to know everything about contracts. I need to know everything about this. Or I need to have all of this artwork. And it's like, yeah, that's, that is definitely holding you back from seeing, I mean, the feedback you will get when you start releasing it is you can improve that artwork. You can improve that artwork. And so if you wait until the very end, you've got a big road ahead of that if no one's resonating with it. Walter agreed that feedback is crucial for building a successful commercial portfolio so you can continue to improve your artwork. And she added, if you wait until the very end, you've got a big road ahead if it's not resonating with anyone. Yes, you need to be proficient in your craft before you build a business from it, but you don't need to wait until it's perfect. Artists who wait for everything to be perfect never get a business going. Step nine, love your baby now. I call the reluctance to market a style as it's evolving Sleeping Beauty Complex. In the Disney version of the Sleeping Beauty fairy tale, a young princess is raised by fairies who protect her from an evil curse until she becomes a woman. Artists who have Sleeping Beauty Complex want to hide their art away until it's fully evolved or grown up so they can avoid criticism or negative feedback. The best way to know if your style is marketable is to start marketing it. Don't wait until your art baby is fully grown before you start loving your art. Love your baby now. When you're just starting out, you may not have lots of fans to validate an idea. But if at least one person loves your art, you've got something to go on. As money mindset mentor Kelly Hollingsworth likes to say, Opportunities are like cockroaches. Where there's one, there's two. Where there's two, there's four. 
And I think this is such a powerful concept for your audience, because as artists, we tend to think, well, one person liked my novel, one person liked my painting. But if there's one, there's two. If there's two, there's four. So you just have to know and trust and believe that there is more there. If one person loved it and if it resonated with one person, it will be true with lots and lots of people behind that one person. When you're about to ask people for feedback, revisit the belief triad. Your belief in your art shouldn't depend on what other people think. If you ask questions such as, do you like it? Or what do you think of my art? Then you're coming from a place of low confidence. People respond differently to the meat question, what do you think, than they do from the confident statement, look at this. If you ask for feedback from a place of low confidence, it will negatively influence the feedback you receive. I see this all the time with artists in their emails. You have to say, this is my yacht, not I have this leaky rowboat. Stop apologizing. If you ask for feedback in a way that presumes your art is less than, you'll be more likely to get negative feedback. When you communicate confidently, you'll receive better feedback. The more you communicate with confidence, the more easily you'll sell your art and your ideas no matter what you're creating. How you feel about yourself and how you feel about what you're making will impact your results. Hollingsworth agrees. She explained, There's an energy about yourself when you're creating that informs what you create. There's bravery. There's courage. You're doing things that other people won't do. And if you're not feeling that way about yourself when you're creating, you're holding back. So I think with art, especially whatever it is that you're hiding from because you're feeling unconfident, that will impair your art and it will impair the way you describe your art. In other words... If you're low on the belief scale, your production process will be adversely affected. So love your baby now. Okay, it's time for a mindset check-in. What's coming up for you? Write down all your fears about expressing yourself in your art and your marketing messages in a way that feels true and authentic. Label your thought distortions. Mind reading? Fortune telling? All or nothing thinking? Notice which thoughts are not serving you. What artpreneurs need to believe. Embrace vulnerability at every step of the way while developing a signature style and brand. Sprinkle just a bit of spice from each of your influences and combine them in a new way so you're completely original. At its core, Weirdness is the magic that separates the merely mundane from the truly special, and it's the secret to fulfilling your destiny as an artist. When your style is based on copying other people, you'll always feel as though you've done it wrong. Marching orders. Go beyond your influences, amplify your quirks, stop people-pleasing, Share your values, embrace imperfection, honor what comes easy for you, open yourself up to feedback, stop procrastinating, love your baby now. Know that you can start late, look different, be uncertain, and still succeed. Misty Copeland. Okay, well, that wraps it up. So remember, if you want all 12 chapters of Artpreneur, just head on over to artpreneurbook.com, order it from your favorite place. And by the way, international people, we found that the best place to order books internationally is Better World Books. They have the most reliable service and the lowest shipping prices. So if you can't get it locally and you don't want to pay high shipping, We found that is the best way to get it. So that's Better World Books. 
And we don't care where you, again, we don't care what format, where you order it from to get your bonus package, artpreneurbook.com. You can read all the different bonuses. We include lots of things to complement the book. All right, my friend, that's it for today. I'll see you the same time, same place next week when we'll be talking about unleashing the power of YouTube and we'll be sharing game-changing strategies for artists featuring my friend Elise Dharma. So make sure you hit subscribe in your podcast app so you don't miss a single episode. Until next time, stay inspired. Thank you for listening to the Inspiration Place podcast. Connect with us on Facebook at facebook.com slash shulmanart, on Instagram at shulmanart, and of course, on shulmanart.com.